Hello and welcome to this round 14 here at ProTorix LAN. I'm Tim Willoughby, joined as always by Simon Gerton. And we are rocketing through these standard rounds. We are getting fast to the point where, well, people are either sweating it out on tiebreakers or hopefully locking up their spot in this top eight. Let's head back down to our feature match area as we get to see a little bit more standard as we get ever closer to Sunday here at ProTorix LAN. Hello and welcome to this round 14 at ProTor Ixalan. I'm Tim Willoughby, joined by Simon Gertsen. And we've seen the sort of the the journey of this uh, Jeskai approach deck from Guillaume Massignon. We're going to be seeing him again this round. Seth Manfield on Sultai Energy is his opponent. We have two former world champions in our feature match area here. Seth winning a couple of years back. Uh, Guillaume Matignon, it took him, uh, it was 2010 that he won with uh, Blue Black Control. He's on a controlish list again here today. Jeskai Approach, uh, he's got red, white, and blue, uh, colors of the French flag uh, control cards. But he's up against Sultai Energy, and this is an energy list that sometimes can have the kind of aggressive draws that can really put a, a hurting on these control decks. Yes, especially powered by Winding Constrictor. And it's interesting because we already saw Matignon um, play against Timur Energy, and we we saw this classical uh, game one where the control deck is better, but then after sideboarding, the amount of threats and the spell pierces and negates really are problematic for, for control decks in this standard format. And Seth Manfield is bringing a similar but different uh, archetype to this to this matchup. Yeah, while it's still relying on energy, this is a list that can utilize that energy in slightly different ways. We can see Glintsey Siphoner in hand already as a card drawing option. The card drawing options from Guillaume Matignon are a little bit more straightforward in the likes of Opt and similar. Let's see how things are looking early doors for Matignon in terms of his hand there. He's got a sensor which can potentially deal with the first threat that's coming from uh, Seth. But aside from that, he's going for the classic control plan involving hitting your land drops each and every turn and potentially getting something going. But the pickup from Opt, a good one with Search for His Canter, looks like that one is something he's willing to wait on at least until he potentially gets value out of this sensor. Matignon is going to be really happy with his hand because a sensor on the play, a lot of lands and a card draw spell, that's pretty much ideal if you want to go into the late game. Seth kicking things off with a Walking Ballista for one. In terms of the two drops that can come from this Salta Energy deck, this is a relatively uh, unexciting one. And actually, Guillaume Matignon saying, yeah, you know what, you can, you can have your 1-1 one, one for two. And it's, it's really nice for him that he was able to cycle a card there. So he didn't even give away the fact that he might have had Sensor. Because utilizing his mana, Seth doesn't really know if, if that was his plan all along. Fantastic point there, Simon. And passing with three mana up, now the list of potential ways that what Seth Manfield wants to get going here can go wrong extends greatly. Uh, a swing for one with Walking Ballista should be pretty safe. And the follow-up play, well, it looks like Seth Manfield is playing around uh, the um, sensor on the other side of things. Let's see Siphoner coming down, that leaving one mana up, and that meaning that sensor getting cycled by uh, Matignon, and he just has to let that 2-1 resolve. Now, one card that's going to be potentially kind of interesting in this matchup, Settle the Wreckage is in hand for Guillaume Matignon. Now, playing it in the very early stages of the game, you are ramping your opponent quite substantially. You know, essentially, you're path casting Path to Exile on every creature your opponent has. But there does come a point in the game where those extra lands normally don't do that much. Exactly. You're, you're playing for Settle the Wreckage, uh, not because the first one is so good, but because every additional one is almost a, an instant speed wrath effect without a downside. Search for Ascanta, the play for Guillaume Matignon in that turn, though. That's something that he's going to be able to uh, get going to smooth his draws early and then draw him extra cards in the late game while ramping his mana all along the way. Three cards already in Graveyard for Guillaume Matignon. It's not going to take too long for him to get that up to the magic number seven to transform it. And Glintsleeve Siphoner is one of the most important cards for Seth Manfield here because this gives him a way to fight the card advantage fight against uh, a Jeskai control deck. If he had this in, uh, in his opening hand, he did uh, make a very smart choice to not expose it to Sensor on turn two, but just to de delay, it, delay it by one turn, simply because it's that much more important than the Ballista. Yeah, the cards that you're going to get from it, you don't necessarily need them 
on turn three. You just need to make sure you actually get them. Uh, attacks here coming in, three points of damage potentially to Guillaume Matignon's life total. And to be honest, the damage that's being dealt in this early stage of the game is almost incidental compared to what we're going to see as the game hits the mid and late stages. Uh, really, really nice uh, is also the fact that walking ballista with one counter is not a huge threat, but makes uh, settle the red wreckage that much more inconvenient to cast. Matignon wants to deal with a single creature on this battlefield, which is the siphoner, but is effectively forced to also deal with the ballista. Now, an essence scatter on uh, a hostage taker that was not really going to take any hostages here. Just a, a two-three creature for the for the mana cost. Yeah, we we. Uh would call that an, a naked hostage taker, basically a, a hostage taker that does not, uh, is not played with the intention of exiling anything. And uh, Guillaume Matignon, actually, his creatures, his tarantula gear hogs, you will almost never be able to get them with a hostage taker. And if you are playing um, Sultai Energy with three, sometimes even four hostage takers, you know that you just get flooded with them. Yeah, there's a heads up play there from Seth simply throwing down the creature. It looked like he was getting low impact from it, but using up an Essence Scatter, that's about as good as he could hope for. And here's that Settle the Wreckage. And Seth Manfield probably does have plenty that he can do with this uh, mana right now. Yes, and uh, he did have the theoretical option to uh, shoot for a point of damage, but getting, getting a land out of his deck is certainly the better, the superior choice. Well, there we can see his hand. He has just a crazy amount of threats in there, including a walking ballista that can now be very large indeed, uh, can potentially put together quite the follow-up here after his first flurry of creatures has been dealt with thanks to that Settle the Wreckage. But Sultai Energy's threats uh, do not match up very well against control decks because, similar to Teamer Energy, you cannot uh, counter approach of the second sun. Walking Ballista is an anti-creature card. Fatal Push is an anti-creature card. Vraska's Contempt is primarily an anti-creature card. So the amount of threats in Manfield's hand is actually not that high. Manfield does have five mana this turn, so he will be able to get a few things going here. I think the goal has to be to just continuously draw cards with Glint Sleeve Siphoner. I think the that is one of the key cards if you want to have a chance in game one. Glint Sleeve Siphoner does come down once more. If there's always one Glint Sleeve Siphoner in play, that's a, a pretty happy amount. It um, doesn't necessarily want to risk losing too many of them in one fell swoop. And a Rishkar Pima Renegade means that both of these creatures now a little bit scarier in the red zone, and it may well be that Seth says he doesn't need too many more creatures in play as long as he's consistently threatening some damage. Yeah, and I, I like this a lot because it's not only is it uh, the the card draw engine of the um, Glint Sleeve, but also you do get the most amount of power onto the battlefield with Rishkar. Well, you know what? When you transform a search for Ascanta, it does accelerate your approach to the second sun, and that means that Guillaume Matignon able to cast it early goes seven cards deep, but the other thing about uh, once you transform your search for Ascanta, seven cards deep isn't really that deep at all when you're looking for your big game-winning sorcery. Ascanta, the Sunken Ruin, it itself lets you dig four cards deep, so it's really not going to be that long before Guillaume Matignon is able to cast a second copy of his big seven-mana sorcery and simply win this game. So the way you can think about this now is it's 23 life on Matignon's side against the cards that are uh, keeping Martino away from that approach of the second sun. So it's not 17 against 23, it's just 23 against those cards in the library. That's the time that Seth has to close up this game. Yeah, normally when we talk about the clock of a game, we're talking about how much damage can a deck deal each turn, how many turns will it take them to kill someone. Here, that those turn counts are more just about cards drawn. And Guillaume Martino's deck is pretty chock full of card drawing, so you may well want to close this out one very fast. Manfield, though, Team Genesis definitely looking for ways of getting himself out of this situation. Long Tusk Cub is one of the creatures that can go very large when it needs to. So, Manfield is pretty confident in his ability to present a two turn clock, but it's virtually impossible for him to just attack for lethal next turn. 
All right, let's see what Guillaume Matignon has for this turn. We've seen him on a number of occasions able to cast back-to-back -back copies of Approach the Second Sun. Does not look like that's on the cards for this game, but does not necessarily need to be. The big question is just now how deep into his deck can he go? Glimmer of Genius, that digs four deep. That is, that is a, a really big deal because here he can now... I'm seeing this correctly, he can now just dig for a land and make sure that he can activate Ascanta, and that's already uh, potentially enough to get to Approach of the Second Sun. Now, obviously, if he sees a land in his initial cards, he kind of wants to scry cards to the bottom because that does dig him a little bit. Well, but, but uh, you, don't need, you don't need to go deeper than the Approach, so actually you, you do have some leeway there with the draw steps that you already have. And you can you can hear these players. Seventeen is now the number that Seth has to um, effectively. He, he knows it's it's actually this turn or never. This is a big ask of Seth Manfield's aggressive Salty energy draw here. He has the long tusk cub. That means that the energy that he's able to produce this turn can translate into damage. He has a uh, walking ballista in play. That means that if he's got excess mana, he can translate that, albeit fairly inefficiently, into more damage. The big question is, can he get to 17? He opted not to convert um, energy into a card with the Siphoner because uh, he, he can convert it to damage with the help of Long Task Cup. So now it's really just uh, a matter of counting up damage and maybe the Walking Ballista actually can make the difference here. We will see. So Long Task Cub potentially representing four damage here. This is going to be very close. It is. Because of, because of Walking Ballista's ability, we might have a situation where Seth can present lethal, forcing Guillaume to not use Escanta, but then maybe he doesn't have uh, enough time to find Approach of the Second Sun. Huge plays here from both of these former world champions. So le let's do the math. We have... Uh, at the moment, 12 power in the in the front row, a plus one uh, from the from the walking wizards. That's 13, which is now 14. And you can already see if Seth invests another four mana into the ballista, he has he doesn't have lethal damage, but he has lethal when he uh, if he chooses to activate the the walking ballista. So suddenly, he is forcing Martignon to interact with his board. And that's something he had to absolutely do, because otherwise an Escanta activation would have won the game for Matignon. Yeah, threatening lethal damage here. It looked like 17 was going to be a very tough ask, but as it turns out, with the, all of those lands produced by Settle the Wreckage for him, he's been able to get something going here. And we see a Harness Lightning in response to the second activation of Long Tusk Cub. Blossoming defense on top, though. That enough to close things out. Fantastic draws for Seth Manfield, able to put enough pressure on to <coughs> take a game one against the Jeskai approach deck. That a really tough ask for almost every deck in this format. Good job by Seth Manfield. We will see more of those two very shortly. And indeed, plenty more magic from our feature match area. Uh, do not go anywhere. We've got a lot of magic here. Uh, we will be back right after these messages. Want to play in the next Pro Tour? Qualifiers are happening this weekend on Magic Online. For more information, visit mtgo.com. Test your skill against your local store community and become store champion this December 25th through 31st. Everyone who plays gets a premium full art rare with top finishers receiving a deck box featuring rivals of Ixalan art. If you win the whole event, you'll get the title of Store Champion and an exclusive Store Champion playmat to commemorate the victory. Find a Store Championship near you at magic.wizards.com slash storechamps.
Hello and welcome back to round 14 here at Pro Tour Ixalan. I'm Tim Willoughby, joined by Simon Gertsen. And while our players are sideboarding in our main match, we're going to get a chance to look in on one of our back tables. Uh, we have Eduardo dos Santos Vieira. He's playing green-white aggro, which right now looks kind of like cat tribal, up against Paul Hur, who is on Team uh, Energy. And you know what? These cats, they look like they've got some moves in this matchup because life total's nine to four in favor of Eduardo. And this is definitely a deck that could find a way of, of sneaking in those last few points of damage if Paul is not very careful yes. indeed. Paul's just double checking uh, Kenra Eternal's text there. A little help from the judges. And then can I also have this card in English? <laughs> and also checking a couple of other cards as well there. Uh, Shefet Ruins there, I believe it is. Potentially pumping up those cats even further. Double strike on various of them. This could be problematic for her here. Yes, the um, green right aggro deck is playing a lot of combat tricks and ways to bolster or pump the creatures. And that's that means if you're on four life, any unblocked creature is, is potentially threatening lethal. I mean, there is a glory bringer in play, play which can potentially take something down here. And Magma Spray is a great answer if you're looking for ways of dealing with what's going on. Just so you know, uh, the the bottom half of what's going on for Eduardo de Santos Vieira, that's his exile zone. The other one is the graveyard, in case there was any confusion there about whether or not we might be seeing some aftermath cards coming up anytime soon. All right, it looks like Paul Herr able to put together a big attack here. The lifelink on that uh, cat may prove just enough to mean that Eduardo de Santos is still in this, but he's going to have to draw fairly well here if he's going to get out of this one. Does not find what he needs. Paul Hurt picking up that game. Eduardo de Santos Vieira and Paul Hurt will be going to their sideboards soon enough. Uh, and plenty of players shuffling in our feature match area right now. I can give you a couple of updates. Uh, Owen Turtonwald picked up his first game against Mike Sigrist. Both of these guys on energy. Mike Sigrist currently the leader on... Uh, points thus far in the Pro Tour, and Piotr Glagowski uh, on Four Color Energy against Pascal Maynard's uh, Godfarer's Gift deck, they're already going to a game three there. So these games going thick and fast in our feature match area. Meanwhile, we're heading back to see that man, uh, Seth Manfield, seeing if he can string two together here against Guillaume Matignon's Jessica Approach deck. He's tellingly the first uh, player we've seen take a game one off this Approach deck. Which is, which is huge, because usually you are the underdog in game one, and then once you have sideboarded these negates, uh, maybe maybe some more planeswalkers or other sticky threats, then you're trying to win two games uh, post board. So I, I think that makes that makes Seth uh, quite the favorite in the in the match. Yeah, just needs to find his way through just one more time. And Guillaume Matignon, six zero in draft, only picked up one loss in constructed yesterday. So. Coming into the constructed rounds here, he knew that he had a relatively clear path. He just needed to keep things going. And right now, he's got to think a little bit about writing the ship. He picked up a loss last round, and this round, he's already a game down. Now is the time for him to really pull, up his, pull himself up by his bootstraps and put something together if he's going to continue his quest for another Pro Tour debate. And uh, in, the, in the previous round, against Michael Sigrist, we saw that the Jeskai approach deck sometimes has the problem that it's just not performing very well. If you don't have turn two search first counter, if you don't have exactly the right uh, counters for your opponent's threats, and then uh, it can become kind of awkward because a seven mana sorcery to, to ultimately win you the game, that's a lot to ask for. So three copies of Torrential Gear Hulk in hand uh, for that opening seven for Guillaume Mastignor, and he says, this is not what I need, shuffles them back, goes to six. Now, mulliganing is obviously a very important skill when you hit the highest levels in Magic. Um, how well would you say that these two decks mulligan uh, compared to one another? Uh, they both mulligan very well because you do have ways to to recoup, let's say, the card disadvantage, but, all, but also if you're lacking, for example, lands, the... Jeskai control deck has a lot of cycling cards and of course search for Escanta. On the other hand, Sultai Energy, if you take a card away from, from an opening opening hand, you still have those four rogue refiners, you have the four attune with Aether, four Glint Sleeve Siphoner, and that's just that's I mean that's the power of energy if we're honest. It's super consistent and generates card advantage with almost almost every play. 
Well, this hand, it's got card drawing. I think it does also have an early sensor. This is a nice place to be. Glacial Fortress, the kickoff for uh, Guillaume Matignon. Meanwhile, a tune with Ether, the ideal turn one play for a deck that's looking to get a few things going on the other side of things. Seth Manfield able to cast it without using any energy, finds his black mana. All three colors sorted, turn one, no big deal. Tune with Ether might secretly be one of the most powerful cards in standard. Yeah, just consistently meaning that you get to play real magic, whether that be hitting all your land drops or indeed hitting the energy that you need to have full force from your powerful energy enablers. Can you imagine your plays land and passes? Oh, it looks like, is that actually two copies of Glimmer of Genius in hand? Can't quite make it out there. Well, I think if there had been a sensor, we would have seen it there. Long Tusk Cub coming down safely. The first energy achieved by Guillaume Matignon. His deck does actually use it in terms of, firstly, fixing mana so that he can get those Harness Lightnings working, but also having those Harness Lightnings able to kill off bigger threats. Oh, my. Winding Constrictor plus uh, Long Tusk Cub. A classic combination that could prove a big problem for Guillaume Matignon in this game, too means that whenever you gain energy, you gain an additional energy. Whenever you spend it with the long task up to make plus one, plus one counters, you get additional plus one, plus one counters. And it just closes out games so, so quickly. And with a blossoming defense as well to protect whichever creature Guillaume tries to stop, this is potentially a huge problem for the Frenchman. Winding Constrictor is the reason for Sultai Energy to exist. And if it, if it uh, stays on the battlefield here, we will, we will soon see why. That a 4-4, four, four. and Guillaume says, I have a response. He does have a sense that he cycles that one, looking for something. No, nope, that Long Tusk Cub is a 4-4 four, four now, chomping away at Guillaume Matignon's life total, generating three energy wi while dealing damage rather than the regulation two, thanks to the Snack there in play helping out. So it does look like uh, Matignon just declined to censor the Long Tusk Cub on turn two. Ether Hub coming down there for Guillaume Matignon. He's got mana, but he's not got much else going for him right now. Meanwhile, Seth Manfield able to get a whole lot going on. Uh, we're hearing that he, he did not have the, the sensor on Okay, uh, That was a slight misread on his hand there on my part, um, but that is ultimately going to potentially mean that Guillaume Matignon is just never able to really even get started in this game. Casting Glimmer of Genius on turn four in abstract, lovely play for your control deck, but not when you're already facing down this kind of a, a barrage of attacks. And Seth is a bit careful here. He doesn't want to just run into a set of the wreckage be when, when he already has such a powerful attack. Just the eight damage coming through. It's still a two-turn clock either way. It makes a lot of sense to just not put yourself in more harm's way than you need to. Uh, he has enough mana to get most things going. And blossoming defense, great against one-for-one -one removal, terrible against the likes of Settle the Wreckage. Yeah, I wonder if it's actually a problem to be relying on Force Settle the Wreckage. Once you know that that's the, the removal of choice, you don't have to play around Fumigate anymore. So Nissa, Student of Elements coming along. Uh, starts at one loyalty, but quickly jumping up to three thanks to the plus, one, plus two in order to scry two. Nissa, Student of Elements, a card that wasn't heavily on my radar for being a potent force in standard, but I've seen a lot of it in the feature match area this weekend and consistently doing very good work. All three abilities proving relevant at various stages in the game. The re reasoning behind that, Tim, is that you want some Planeswalkers, especially in these kind of matchups, and if you're Soul Tie Energy, you simply can't play Chandra. Wow, a super fast game too there. Seth Manfield, the one-two punch of Long Tusk Cub and uh, Winding Constrictor, able to finish things up very, very straightforwardly. And um, we're going to get a chance to jump across and see a little bit of Owen Turtonwald versus Mike Sigris. Turtonwald having picked up the first game against the current leader in our standings here at Pro Tour uh, The matchup is Tima Energy versus Four Color Energy. We know that both these players will have tested this matchup to a huge degree. Let's see how it plays out in these post cyborg games. Sure. You can see already a World of Virtuoso in play for both of these players. The difference, though, Sigrist has 14 energy to work with. On the other side of things, not quite so much for Owen Turtle, well, just the five, and Rogue Refiners and such doing great work for Sigrist in terms of making sure that 
if we're looking for who has advantage energy-wise, it's not really that close. And it is, it is very interesting how the energy count somehow is uh, indicative of how well things are going for the player. It's um, not that ener energy on its own serves much of a purpose, but if a player has been able to run that far ahead on the energy count, it, it just means that things have been going better for them. So Magma Spray, they're dealing with one Servant of the Conduit. Another copy still in play for Mike Sigurist. And there is a Vizier with many faces in play. Uh, not quite sure what that one's copying just yet. We'll find out soon enough. And of course, if it does get killed off, there's nothing to say that it will not come back at some point. A uh, Rogue Refiner. Uh, sounds like it's a Rogue Refiner that's in play. And that one of the cool things about Vizier with many faces, it's always got targets, always able to generate a little bit of an advantage even before you start thinking about playing from the graveyard. Team with Ether helping Owen's energy count here. The one area where Owen currently in the lead uh, in this game, of course he is in the lead in the match also, is on life totals. How much do you really, like, at what point when you're looking at life totals in this matchup do you start thinking, I need to t pay a bit of attention here and make sure that I'm careful on blocks and so on? Um, in particular, when you are in danger of losing to Burl of Trails of Flyers. So, for example, if Owen was on a life total that was threatened by, a, let's say, a two-turn clock, then, then uh, he would have a problem. But of course, he's on Trantic Life. That's not really, that's not really a problem. I think ultimately most of these matchups are decided by uh, Thopter tokens. Well, if Thopter tokens are the big deal, then currently Mike Sigrist in nice shape. A uh, little update for you from one of our back tables. Eduardo de Santos Vieira has been able to pick up his game two against Paul Herr. They are going to a game three. Plenty of action here in our feature match area as these players desperate to pick up the kind of record that means they could potentially get to top eight. At nine and four, uh, Santos Vieira will have to win out and then kind of hope on tiebreakers a little bit. But you know what? His green-white deck it seems very cool. I'm certainly hoping that we get a chance to see a little bit more of it in our feature match area before the end of the weekend. Oh, sorry. Yes, I thought <laughs> that. So Thopters just trading off all over the shop. Unfortunately for Owen, also having to let his Well of Virtuoso hit the graveyard here. Yeah, and to uh, Owen actually with a super weak hand, only a supreme will to, to do anything with, and Sigrist has uh, more than he, he will likely need. Yeah, he's got two Planeswalkers, one Scarab God that feels like a pseudo Planeswalker given the number of abilities going on. And this is Steward of Elements uh, coming into play here for Sigrist. And coming in at two loyalty, plus two here, means that there's the potential to threaten the minus six a turn earlier. And the minus six is actually pretty relevant because it's another way of generating flyers. Turning two of your lands into five, five elemental creatures with flying and haste. If it gets to the super late game, you can potentially just cast it with X equals six and use it as a, a burn spell to make two five, five flyers. And it wouldn't surprise me if at some point this tournament, uh, Mike Sigurus has been able to do exactly that. Game face very much on at the moment for own turn. Well, that seven next to his name indicating that he's currently our number seven ranked player in the world. A member of Peach Garden Oath who have been working on Team Energy incessantly for quite a while now, with William Jensen, of course, winning the world championship with a list hauntingly similar to this one. And you can tell by the speed that these players are playing with. They both have tested this matchup extensively. Owen is now looking for ways to, to stop this assault, but um, he can't be too optimistic about his chances this game. I guess that at least he has that buffer of knowing that he's got a game in hand, so even if this one goes pear-shaped, there's still room to put something together here. Sigurist of Team Channel Fireball here, carefully considering his blocks. Vizier of the Many Faces being in the graveyard, in some respects, something that is a little bit more scary than it being in play, uh, but with potential targets to get copied here. Bristling Hydra coming along as the creature for Owen Turton World, meaning that there's even more juicy targets for that Vizier of the Many Faces when it comes back with Embalm. 
Yeah, and this is this is an interesting matchup when it comes to um, how to come back from from a deficit, how to catch up, because simply because the cards are so powerful, the Rogue Refiners, the Verlo Rochosos, there are catch-up mechanisms just built into these cards. However, if the advantage of one player is too dominant, and I think we're we are reaching that point, then even even the perfect cards of the top, even all the Rogue Refiners and Glory Bringers you can you can dream of, will just not be fast enough to, to convert. Well, Vraska, Relic Seeker, also coming down for Mike Sigrist, so he's got two Planeswalkers on high, lo high loyalty. He's also got plenty of creatures and blockers. He's got seven energy with which to make still more blockers, should he so choose. Huh? Massive uphill idea. struggle here for Owen Turtenwald to close this one out, even on 17 life. And you can see that uh, Owen's, Owen's game face is on. He doesn't give anything away. He's sitting there with two basics in hand, uh, <laughs> two Planeswalkers, and now four creatures on, on the opposing side. This is this is a, a, a game where no, you're not happy that you're four points of life ahead. Yeah, Mike Sigurist, if he didn't draw anything but basics at this point, would probably still be in reasonable shape. And as it stands, he's got Scarab God just waiting in the wings saying, put me in the game, coach. Vizier coming down, copying that Bristling Hydra. Still more energy being generated here. And Nissa being attacked here. Owen respecting the fact that we... Oh, sorry, that was copying a Rogue Refiner, the uh, Vizier of Many Faces. But in the meantime, attacking Nissa, and that likely to pr prompt a block here from Mike Sigrist. Uh, there is the potential for a Planeswalker to be taken down here. Owen really wanted to dig deeper into his deck. That's why he decided that he doesn't need a second hide, where he needs the cards, uh, or the extra card offered by, by Rogue sure. Refiner. Right, plenty of lands in play. Anissa on six, Avraska on eight. Embarrassment of riches for Mike Sigrist here as he looks to close out this game. 17 minutes still on the clock, so plenty of time to finish a third game if Mike Sigrist picks up this one. And judging by our advantage bar and indeed the board state, it seems likely that we will be seeing a game three between these two. just hearing that there has also been a deck check on this uh, table. So they've actually got an, a, a time extension as well. So for those of you hoping to see this match come to a full conclusion, I think that's quite likely at this point. Sigrist here, just letting things carry on out here. Got so many different uh, Planeswalker abilities to work with. Even if he didn't have cards in hand, he'd have a lot going on. As it stands, he also has lots of cards in hand to work with. We can see yet another Planeswalker that he could cast without having to worry about the Planeswalker legend rule. And yep, the writing's on the wall. Owen Turnwell scooping up his cards. He's not going to win that game going to have to go to game three for that one. And we're going to get a chance to see another game three as we move across to the one other match still going on in our feature match area, that one being between Eduardo Dos Santos Vieira and Paul Herr. Dos Santos Vieira on green-white aggro, Paul Herr on team energy. And this time around, it looks like the energy is the deck that is um, on the more aggressive start, which is saying something considering the way that the green-white deck tends to play things out. Yeah, absolutely. And I was uh, looking forward to seeing a bit more of the of the aggressive green-white deck, um, or Ixalan Zoo as it's called, by the Brazilian team. And you can t you can see that uh, Teamer Energy sometimes is just so aggressive that even even your aggro deck has to go into defense mode. Yeah, it's, it's really difficult to characterize the uh, the Teamer Energy deck. Sometimes I think that the safest way of thinking about it is almost like it, it's like a, a Jun deck of old that is generating value in a bunch of different ways. Sometimes it'll be being very aggressive. Sometimes it can ha take a slightly more controlling role. But every time it's doing things, as long as it's casting spells, it's it's achieving a lot of value from its cards. And who doesn't love Jun? 
I mean, I know at least one person in this uh, booth who's had a lovely time with Jund, uh, winning a Pro Tour with it back in 2010. Meanwhile, Paul Herr, he's doing his best impression of that. He's got his magma spray to deal with one of the creatures on the other side of the battlefield. Big swings from him here. And with Eduardo de Santos Vieira on nine life, he has to block that big lung tusk cub here. And Adanto's, Adanto Vanguard's ability of paying for life is a bit, bit worse when you're behind in the race. And when you're this far behind in the race, it's almost completely offline, taking plenty of damage here. It's going to have to be a gigantic top deck from Eduardo de Santos Vieira if he's going to stay in this game. Uh, I think he's already going down to one uh, this turn. And I doubt that this green-red aggro deck is playing Fumigate. It seems like it would be a bit of a stretch. Uh, plays a land, does have the Ooh. Fumigate though. Huge draw for Eduardo de Santos Vieira here. That's exactly what he needed to get back in this game. Kills off all of the creatures on the other side of the battlefield. No creatures on his side dying. Gains a little bit of life in the process. Now at five life. All right, passes things back to her. Let's see where we go from here. Paul was not expecting that. I don't think any of us were, as we f relatively clearly dictated by suggesting he didn't have the card in his deck. Turns out we were bang wrong on that one. Seven of the Conduit coming down for Paul Her here, trying to get something going. Looks like he did have more threats to work with. Double Servant of the Conduit. It doesn't take very many threats when your opponent's at five life in order to uh, present a potentially lethal board very, very quickly indeed. Another land here for Eduardo. Let's but, see but if that he can was a, with a it. huge comeback and uh, probably just smart sideboarding. That's something that uh, Team or Energy is, is just not used to, playing against aggressive decks that can, can somehow come back from, from such a dominant board position. Just the one creature there from Dos Santos Vieira. He's potentially going to take another hit here. Looks like it does have uh, a blossoming defense in order to keep that one creature alive, though. And by giving it plus two, plus two, the attacks from Paul Herr not looking quite so exciting. He's able to survive the turn. Each and every turn, a blessing now for Eduardo de Santos Vieira. Needs to build his board up a little bit. A Ketra the True, that will help. He has enough mana that he's going to be able to start powering out creatures soon enough with the god. And once it starts being able to attack and block, Things getting very interesting, but going to three on that set of attacks because right now Aketra not doing too much. What is Paul Herr's follow up? Whirl of Virtuoso, that a fantastic draw for Paul Herr because it means that the number of things that Eduardo needs to get going in order to be able to uh, be using his blockers to the biggest effect is going to be kind of tough. Ether Sphere Harvester coming along. Got some energy alongside it. And while Aketra may not be attacking or blocking, she doesn't mind driving a car around. This is actually giving Paul pause because attacking is not as profitable as he had hoped. But DeSantis Vieira, I believe now, just living off the top of his deck, no more cards in hand for him, I do not think. So each and every draw step will be a sweat for the Brazilian and Paul Herr just trying to find a way of eking out those final few points. It looked like he had it just a few short turns ago. Fumigate dealt with that first wave of attacks, but still more cards in hand for Paul. But Eduardo has at least one uh, embalmed creature in his graveyard, eternalized creature in his graveyard. So he's not drawing dead. He can, of course, start making creature tokens as well. Maybe even make a make a huge life gain swing with the help of the harvester. So he did make a creature at the end of the turn. We're just fetching the appropriate tokens for that. Uh, our main table is ready to go, but I think we want to sit here and just see whether or not we can uh, find Eduardo de Santos Vieira pulling his way out of this downward spiral he was in when we joined him, um, gradually just piecing together what he needs to maybe be able to come back into this game. Dos Santos Vieira desperately trying to find something to get things together now. Each and every card that he draws will have an impact, even land useful to him because it means that he's uh, god that much more active. And and that's that's the turn I was hoping I was hoping to see, just uh, somehow trying to turn the race around in your favor. You have to put pressure on Teamer Energy, and Eduardo can somehow bank on the fact that Paul probably oversightboarded, not expecting this game to go so long and Fumigate to show up. 
Eduardo de Santos Vieira gaining a big old chunk of life here as well, thanks to that Eternalize pumping up his Aether Sphere Harvester. Yep, the life turtles suddenly moving up for Eduardo de Santos Vieira. We are going to have to move back to our front table now. We want to make sure that we are able to complete all of our rounds before the rest of the tournament is fully completed. So we're going to get a chance to see uh, some more of Mike Sigris against Owen Turtonwell. But do not fear, we will bring you the updates of what's going on in that other match as well, because our feature match area right now, it's got some exciting magic going on. Owen oh, Turtonworld kicking things off here. Uh, we look at Mike Sigrist's hand. He's got a Servant the Conduit on two and plenty of action as the game goes later also. Uh, if you had to sort of piece together ideal hands, I would say that both these players have something approaching it. They've got early interaction. They've got late game threats. We're going to see a real game of magic here. Yeah, I, I mean, I ideal is um, probably... You, you can you can have some very absurd starting, starting hands, which... Um, well, I think a turn three Planeswalker is probably a good start. Yeah, I mean, while H Harness Lightning is a fantastic way of dealing with creatures, um, it does nothing against these Planeswalkers, and it may well be that Owen Turtonwald is able to keep this uh, Nissa in play for a couple of turns. If that's the case, then he's going to be in good shape. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, by killing the Servant, he denied Sigris the opportunity for a turn three Chandra, which would have been a huge threat to his Planeswalkers. So Chandra is kind of the trump card if you're looking at um, Planeswalker battling it, Planeswalkers battling it out. Now, it, there we had uh, Owen Turtonwald. He knew that there was a land on top of his deck thanks to the scry from Nissa. So it was the middle ability on Nissa getting used there. Looked at the top card, it was a land and he got to put it into the battlefield. Yeah, these, these two abilities, of course, designed together to work together. And another copy of Harness Lightning dealing with yet another threat from Mike Sigrist. Yes, there's still a Thopter in play and it does get to attack Nissa, but this is the real painful moment where Chandra gets to fully take down the uh, Nissa and that enough to get our advantage bar first moving for the course of this game. Chandra, the one Planeswalker on the battlefield, dealing with Nissa, slight bit of a flavor fail potentially there, but wow, just absolute hammer blows on both sides of things. Glorybringer attacking in, no exert here just dealing with Chandra Torture Defiance. But not quite dealing with it. So um, the difference between four and five loyalty, loyalty being absolutely huge here. Well, I just heard some cheering in the background. And well, if you have to guess which side won when there's cheering going on at the, at the Pro Tour. It's always Brazilian. It's always the Brazilians. Eduardo de Santos Vieira did manage to pick up that game against Paul Herr. Massive victory for him there. I'm sure he'll be very, very pleased with that indeed. Uh, he advancing now to 10 and 4, still in the race to potentially have another Brazilian in top 8. Looks like Sigris is also looking at Chandra's defeat. A super powerful sideboard card in this, in this standard. So he has now quite a lot of um, re reactive cards that will help him protect uh, Chandra if, if that's something he, is, uh, he decides to do. Yeah, glory bring out falling to Chandra's defeat equally as well as Chandra herself would. A tick up there of uh, Chandra. Oh, m maybe just for mana to, to deploy glory bring out? No. I think so, yeah. yeah. Just tapping three lands in order to be able to cast a five drop is no mean feat. <laughs> now, of course, they can't be an exert from Glory Bringer to kill Glory Bringer because it's non dragon creatures. But a 4 4 hasty flyer, absolutely fine, and Chandra's defeat dealing with Glory Bringer on the other side of the battlefield. I think, I think that one mana uh, tempo swing of Chandra's defeat, that's. Uh, really, something that Owen didn't want to see there. That's he needs. He needs uh, some comeback here. The confiscation coup, maybe. Confiscation coup is certainly a nice one. No energy at the moment around for Owen Turnwald, though. If if Owen is holding another Glorybringer, he can now kill um, Chandra, and then the board will be at relative parity. Mike will still be uh, at an advantage, but. Um, it wouldn't be so bad. However, if I if I read this situation correctly, Turtonwald is staring at a rootbound crag, and I don't see a mountain or a forest in his uh, in, on his battlefield. Yeah, I mean, even in a three color energy build, sometimes you can have these slightly clunky mana draws. And that was 
super unfortunate. He he's he has an ether hub, but he has zero energy. He has the red source, but he cannot play it on tap. Unable to cast a glory bringer that turn, and that means that Mike Sigur is you know, the world is his oyster here. He's able to get everything going at least for one more turn. Ticks up Chandra, gets to deal some damage to Owen. Attacks in, deals still more damage to Owen. A very rough spot for Turtenwald here. Supreme Will at the end of turn just to act as an impulse, try and find another useful card for this matchup. And actually, by the looks of things, what he's seeing isn't a particularly exciting collection of cards. I don't think he's going to be too sad to be able to put most of them to the bottom. Now, what he really wanted was to um, to trade this Supreme Will for a spell by Sigrist. So let's say the last threat of Sigrist uh, would have been another Planeswalker, you Supreme Will it, then you Glorybringer, get rid of the Chandra, and then you're just hoping to stabilize on 3-life. Well, here is Glorybringer, late to the party, but still very much welcome. Looks like there's another copy of Chandra in hand for uh, Mike Sigurist. He's even got a Harness Lightning, and this could be lights out for Owen Turtenwald here in round 14. Uh, life totals 20 to 8, and we have five points of damage coming through on attacks here. Chandra's ticking up. Yeah, even if it wasn't a land on top, I think it was likely we were going to see Sigurist, two damage there. Sigurist is actually holding a second Chandra, which uh, should just be lethal here. Yeah, there's no... Responses from Owen Turtmold beyond to extend his hand. Mike Sigrist advancing to 13 and 1 with just a couple of rounds left on this Pro Tour. I'm going to call it. I think this puts him in good shape for top 8. Yeah. We're, we're, ac we're actually hearing that uh, at, as Lethal was on the stack there, Mike Sigrist, in fact, offered an intentional draw to Owen Turtenwald. Uh, essentially, I guess that that was his recognition of the fact that a draw is still really good for him in terms of his top eight potential. Uh, and it may just be a matter of um, he feels like his matchup there is better than perhaps some of the decks that are more specifically gunning for energy that are going into these latter stages. Th these two players have a ton of respect for each other. They are friends and colleagues, if you, if you want. So uh, Sigrist knows he doesn't need uh, that match win, a draw is enough for him to secure top eight. So he's um, he's happy with Owen getting that extra point out of out of the, the that match. So we saw a huge variety of decks in the feature match area. Very excited to hear about Eduardo de Santos Vieira with his green white list, able to triumph against uh, Paul Hurst's team at Energy. Potentially going to see some more of him in the feature match area in these last few rounds. But two rounds left to go. It is anybody's guess exactly what our top eight is going to look like. We've got a Mike Sigrist, but everyone else is still fighting out for those other seven spots. Do not go anywhere because, well, we've got seven spots to fill, and I'm very excited to see how we fill them. We'll be back for more magic with you very soon indeed. But first, these messages.
Hello everyone, 14 rounds down, two to go. That means things are getting very tight at the top. People are playing for top eight, people are playing for pro points. People also, Maria, are playing for a slot somewhere in between those two. There's a very important number and that number is 11. Yeah, so uh, one of my friends, we've been talking about him all weekend, it's his first pro tour, Sam Illenfeld of Tower Games, uh, just came bounding up to me on the floor, just a beaming smile on his face, and he gave me a high five and he says, I'm going to Bilbao. Fantastic, so 11 and three at your first pro tour. Now, of course, the trick now is not to worry about the plane ticket to Spain, but worrying about whether you can go there as a champion of a pro tour, because he's got, if he wins his next round, 12 and three, he's in the mix to potentially intentionally draw the last round, or at the very least, win again, and that would put him in the top eight. And at 11 and three, why stop there? Well, someone who hasn't been stopping all weekend long is Mike Sigrist of Team Channel Fireball. He is at 12, one and one. Let's hear from him with Brian David Marshall. Thanks, Rich. I'm here with former player of the year, Mike Sigrist, off to a pretty good start this year here 12 one and one and you feel like you've locked up a slot here in the top eight yeah i'm pretty sure yeah I'd, some pretty bad stuff would have to happen for that <laughs> not to happen yeah uh this would be the third pro tour top eight in your career mm -hmm. i mean how how rare are these opportunities that you know come along where you know everything lines up you're playing well you've got the right deck the right team and you can get to that sunday stage that's uh, super rare i, I mean the Magic players in general have just gotten so much better since I've started playing. Like, everyone I play, like, you know, there's so many people, you don't even know their names in there, you know. I, I, I'm just utterly impressed by how well they played against me. I'm like, wow, that guy played better than me. I've never never seen him before. <laughs> so, yeah, it's really rare to, to be able to get this lucky and, and you know, hopefully uh, make it into the top eight of a Pro Tour. Now, you're playing the four-color energy deck. Talk to me about the deliberation process that the team went through to decide on this deck, like, you know, you, I imagine you had to try really hard to find something else other than energy that you wanted to play. Oh yeah, we tried, we explored everything. I mean, we have a lot of, you know, great players and a lot of them, like we have like 18 people on the team or something this time. I'm not sure exactly the number. And, you know, we went down every avenue. And then uh, the last, you know, this past week, we just, most of us just really focused on energy because we just couldn't find anything that would be consistent against the post board. The deck's just, such a good deck and has such a good sideboard that it would I, I just we just all thought it would be stupid not to play it i mean the deck has been really good to you so far this weekend you're undefeated in standard uh you start looking maybe towards a constructed master title and an invite to worlds next year uh, yeah we'll see hopefully i can just get there without it i mean i'm that's that's so far down the road but i'm just going to focus on this for now and try to take this one down if i can and of course your team uh, came into this round in the lead in the team series uh, and of course a top eight and you know the further you go there is uh, pretty big to carry the team forward what, what kind of uh, feeling would that be after all the teasing that went on this weekend if you're the guy that propels the team up in front are you gonna you're gonna not gonna hold that over anyone are you uh, oh of course not <laughs> yes I'm going to flip the script on them <laughs> yeah you better believe it <laughs> and rich I'm looking for you too rich wherever you are <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mike Sigris, uh, he's right over there, and we're going to send it back to him right now. <laughs> Thanks so much, BDM. Rich is just incredulous over here. He cannot believe it. <laughs> well, we've saw, seen a lot of really cool, innovative decks this weekend, and we've got another one coming up with a deck tech with Patrick Chapin.